morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being with us in this fifth table called Proof of Discrimination of the Seventh International Congress on Constitutional Law, Equality and Non-Discrimination organized by the Constitutional Studies Center of the Supreme Court of Justice of Nation. My name is Josue Beristein, and I will moderate today's table. I remind you that we have simultaneous interpretation into English and Spanish. The Spanish broadcast will be done through our official website, Facebook, and the, our YouTube channel. And the English broadcast will be done through the Center, uh, Constitutional Studies Center website. And the chat box are active uh, in our broadcasting platforms. So you can post your questions about this table. The coordinating team will gather them and at the end we will ask these questions to the speakers. Without further ado, we will start today's table. First, I would like to thank our speakers for their participation in this Congress and also to learn from them today in a very important topic, which is the proof of discrimination. I'm going to read their uh, CV in the order in which they will present. Alejo Joaquin Giles is a lawyer from the National University of La Plata and a master's degree from University of Alicante and a master of probative uh, approach. He's studying a PhD uh, in philosophy of law in the University of Genoa. His research is in the probative analysis and legal argumentation. Thank you very much for being with us. Silvia Serrano is a lawyer from the National University of Mucarama in Colombia. Her research is focused in the study of international law of human rights, as well as the compared constitutional law and philosophy of law. She works in the Institute of Rev and Deputy Professor of Law. Silvia also teaches in master's degree in several schools and law institutions in Latin America. Thank you very much, Silvia, for being with us. Ana Maria Ibarra is, has a PhD in law from the University of Virginia in the US. For more than eight years, she was Secretary of Studies and specialized source in human rights under Justice Arturo Saldívar. He is interested in the evolution of the autonomy of children, the identity uh, law, and the, light, the right of uh, the law of free development of personality. Since 2009, she is Deputy Director of the Constitutional Studies Center of the Supreme Court of Justice, and she was appointed Justice of Circuit. Thank you, Justice, for being with us. I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Alejo Joaquin Giles. You will have 25 minutes to present. You have the floor, Doctor. Well, thank you very much, Josue, for your introduction. I'd like to start by thanking the Constitutional Studies Center for the invitation to participate in this magnificent Congress and all the audience for listening to us. In Mexico and other ports, in this panel about the proof of discrimination, I'm going to start by talking about the concept of discrimination, but from a provative approach. What I'm going to do during these minutes and also as a preamble to what uh, my colleagues will present is to offer a systematization of the concept of discrimination that will allow to warn clearly what are the descriptive phrases involved in the cases of discrimination or in other words, what is the purpose of the proof according to the type of discrimination in each case. We're going to start with some cases. Let's suppose that 
a person with a disability goes to a job interview. He has excellent qualifications, the best qualifications among the candidates, but, but he is not hired. One could say that with other elements, this could be an action of discrimination. In parentheses, I mentioned the Mexican Supreme Court that has used some cases as basis for this. Now let's suppose that this person talking to colleagues, he sees that other disabled people had the same problem in the same company with other opportunities. So in that case, you could say with other elements that this is a practice, a discriminatory practice. Now imagine a rule that bans disabled people to vote, like the electoral law of the state of Nuevo León, in the case in parentheses, that was uh, judged by the Supreme Court. We can say that this rule is directly discriminatory. And now let's imagine another rule that affects somehow those who work as uh, domestic workers, like the social security law in Mexico, that was analyzed in the case I cite in parentheses. And also 97.6% of those who work in this sector are women, according to the National Occupation and Employment Survey of Mexico. One can say that this is a case of indirect discrimination. But What's the similarity between these cases? So what are the common elements to be part of a phenomenon that we called in the same manner? On the other hand, what's different about them? Why, why do we say they are different variants of discrimination? Well, I'll try to give an answer through a redefinition of the term discrimination with a double approach tactic. On one hand, I'm going to propose a generic definition of discrimination to answer to the first question. What do uh, this phenomenon phenomena have in common? And on the other hand, the second approach will be the variance or, or, or types of discrimination in order to answer to the second question, that is, what's different between them. And with this, I'm going to demonstrate in the last section of my presentation, it's useful to identify the different objects of proof in the cases of discrimination. And then think about what type of problems may occur in these cases and how we can address them. So let's start with the beginning. So the generic def definition of discrimination. I think that a good way to identify the elements that compose the cases of discrimination is in turn to differentiate it from another idea, which is the idea of a distinction. How can we distinguish allow me the pun, how can we make a, an ordinary distinction of what we call discrimination? So my proposal, what am I assuming? For law, it's worthwhile to, to know what we call discrimination in law and distinguish these two expressions. If discrimination is thought as a sort of distinction, but then if it's a sort of 
that differentiates it from other distinctions. Very well. So I'm going to explain this briefly. So we can agree that is that they are differentiated by these three factors. According to this proposal, discriminating is performing a distinction that consists in treating some people worse than others by virtue of uh, possessing certain attributes that one that is specially protected by law and without an adequate justification. So little by little, I'm going to specify this first approach. When I talk about treating, it seems that a good way to define this for purposes of discrimination is, is to think about treatment as a certain distribution of goods or services. Treat someone in this sense is to distribute goods or services, go from a distributive state to other. And the treatment should be worse in full two elements, at least that help us to identify what we mean when we talk about discrimination. On one hand, to say that there was discrimination, this requires a comparative analysis. We have to compare the treatment conferred to one person or a group of persons. So what do we compare? Levels of access to certain service or good. In many cases, this can be simple. Zero or one, either he has or not has access. And in other cases, the level of access is, has different magnitudes. He has access in a different degrees, worse or harmful, or maybe with a different frequency. If it is discrimination between groups of people. The second component that suggests the idea of worse is that saying there's discrimination implies a, a judgment. Because every time we say something is worse than the other, we're saying that the other one is preferable according to certain system of values, that is different values moral, instrumental, epistemic, aesthetic, etc. So comparative involves value judgments. This second element that characterizes discrimination, I'm talking about certain attributes that are protected. What do I mean by this? Discrimination is in people who have certain trait or characteristic that on which the, the law establishes a protection. In which sense? Well, at least one a rule of the legal system establishes that is prohibited to perform uh, harmful distinctions on those people who have those traits. It can be race, sex, religion, and many other. As a normally uh, legal systems do, but not all of them select the same traits. This depends on the context of each legal system and the social reality of each context. And the traits by which normally a person is distinguished or harmed. So a protected attribute and this second element also speaks of certain link or bond between the harmful treatment and the possession of this type of attributes one should receive a harmful treatment because you possess that type of attribute. And this link is, or takes place according to the treatment. If it's discrimination, 
the person who gives that treatment has the purpose of harming you because you have that trait. If you talk about, we talk about the discriminatory rule, maybe the norm itself or rule sets the possession of that attribute as the example we saw earlier. So among other types of links that I will mention later. The third element is the justification. A harmful distinction, etc., can't be discriminatory if it's justified. This has exceptions that in other moments have been the rule that have to do with distinctions with respect to certain traits for direct discrimination, such as sex, race. There are legal systems that say, based on these distinctions, it is forbidden, or based on these traits, it is forbidden to make any distinction notwithstanding the justification. But beyond these assumptions, there's a case of discrimination when the distinction doesn't have a justification. And the idea of justification brings to mind uh, value judgments. Is it justified or not according to a system of values that is involved or that is in place? Uh, courts and the Supreme Court of Mexico is not the exception. They turn to the idea of the test of proportionality that has different elements in turn. It analyzes whether the end is legitimate, the end of the distinction, and then it analyzes if there's a, a relationship of instrumental adaptation between the distinction and the end, if it's necessary, or there are better alternatives, or if, it, if it's proportional in the narrow sense. That is, if the affected rights are affected not only according to what is acceptable in this kind of cases. Now, I'm interested in proportionality because I like to highlight the idea of uh, judgments of instrumentality. If something is adequate instrumentally for an end, when it leads to attain that state, that is the end. Then I'm going to go back to this idea later. So the justification should also be adequate. There are different degrees with which certain distinction can be justified. And I, 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 I can say this can be measured, but it can't be uh, justified or little justified. And therefore, we have different levels of scrutiny. Maybe you know this uh, term for the analysis of the justification of one distinction. When we have a high level of scrutiny, there's a high degree of justification under these terms. Now, once I presented the generic definition, it's a proposal about what the cases of discrimination have in common. Now, I'm going to talk about the types of discrimination the different variants of this generic definition. And I'm going to start with a very well-known one, which is the distinction between uh, factual and normative discrimination. It depends on the uh, factor of treatment. If the treatment is done through actions or through norms. And this way we introduce the notion or the idea of discriminatory action. What's a discriminatory action? To define this, we can use the concept of action. What's an action? For instance, when someone produces 
intentionally certain change in the world, the change from one state to the other. So this notion of action has to be components. This is a simplified explanation. On one hand, external facts, changes in the world produced by people, the movements of people. And on the other hand, internal facts or uh, mental status. What's the intention of people? What defines an action is the intention of the, sub, of the individual. If you're in the sea and you wave your hand, what defines if you are asking for help or you are saying hi is the intention of the individual, what he wants to do. When you see it, you can't know, but you can infer it from other elements. So, so what's a discriminatory action? Well, the external element is a distribution of certain goods or services for certain individuals, and the internal element consists in the intention to, of harming those who have certain protected attributes or else it is a case of indirect discrimination that I will explain later, even lacking this intention, maybe the external facts and the effects have a harmful effect on those individuals. And in that case, we would say it is a discriminatory action. When there are many actions of the same sort, that is, on the same type of goods and on the same individuals, we can say this is a practice, a discriminatory practice. As I said before in the first example, the first two examples, when a person is not hired due to his or her disability, that's an action. But if a company frequently does this, this is a discriminatory practice. If it's not factual discrimination, it is a normative discrimination. That is when the source of the treatment is a legal rule. That is the content of a legal rule prohibits or enforces, etc., consists in in an effect that leads to the distribution of goods or services that is harmful for certain group of people. When we have normative discrimination, the norms that prohibit to discriminate based on certain attributes indicate the legislative branch how they should legislate. Now, Let's go to other type of discrimination that we've seen, which is the direct discrimination or the indirect discrimination. This is a very simple proposal. I'm not going to repeat what has been studied and how we conceive direct discrimination is the link between the criterion of distinction and the possession of protected attributes and indirect uh, discrimination, the, the foregoing doesn't happen. So they doesn't, it doesn't use a criterion for the distinction, but it has harmful effects for those who possess these attributes. The example can be the one we saw in the beginning a norm that uh, harms those who are domestic workers because they a priori do not possess a protected attribute. But if we see how this is composed, it is uh, mostly composed by women, which is a protected group. So we would say that it has harmful effects on this group indirectly, that is the norm in question. So I'm going to delve into the impact of the of discrimination. 
the Supreme Court, the first and the second chambers gave a definition about this. They talk about provisions, criteria, or practices apparently, apparently neutral that put a social group in a clear disadvantage before the rest, or in other terms, it talks about laws, policies, or practices that are apparently, apparently neutral, but they uh, harm disproportionately certain groups. So it's apparently neutral. It can be translated into the criterion I just mentioned. That is, it is apparently neutral when the criterion practice or provision is not based in a protected uh, attribute, but it has a harmful effect. So this idea of discriminatory impact is quite interesting because I'd like to highlight three issues. Number one, who, who are affected? It's a group of people. When you say, that it is a norm, an action, it has a discriminatory impact. You are seeing that it has an impact on a group of people with certain characteristics. It has uh, protected attributes compared to other group that do not have these attributes. So it's comparative and in turn, it has also a statistical impact because we need to measure the frequency with which women will be harmed by applying a norm that we mentioned in the beginning and the frequency with which men will be harmed. But it doesn't need all the group of women to be harmed by a norm. And also, it's about individual circumstances of a specific person. On the other hand, I'm going to explain the, what a uh, discriminatory impact is. One can say that in the descriptive aspects, it consists in an unequal distribution of certain goods or services. And in the evaluative aspects, it implies uh, value judgments so that this impact is disadvantageous. This has to be argued, but this is a value judgment and it should be a disadvantageous, not a, just any disadvantage. Finally, I'd like to highlight that in some assumptions, the link between the factor and the discriminatory factor will be logical and in others it would be empirical. So they, we have a causality relationship. Another interesting classification is the intersectional discrimination or simple discrimination. Intersectional discrimination is when a group of people have more than one protected attribute and the harm is produced by that overlay of attributes and not because they have one attribute or the other. And then statistical discrimination has to do with the justification of one distinction. If a norm, let's suppose, uses a trait because they understand that possessing that trait is statistically relevant for the possession of other, it will have a statistical foundation that is the distinction. When that found statistical foundation is incorrect, we could say this is a case of discrimination, statistical discrimination. And now to finish, I like to show this conceptual clarity on by how by understanding what discrimination, what we have to prove in those cases and have more, more clarity on the type of problems often happen and see how we can address them. So I'm going to focus on the descriptive phrases. <laughs> 
involved in each type of discrimination, leaving aside the evaluative uh, phrases. So we are going to start with uh, discriminatory actions, saying that X discriminated Y can be translated that X performed a discriminatory action with respect to Y. In that case, we have phrases referring to the following phenomenon. Uh, body movements by X, the events provoked by those body movements, the immediate action that is what type of actions X is performing. He wanted to harm the person or not due to his traits and the uh, intention, what they were looking for, the immediate uh, intention. Now for discriminatory practices, it, well, the phrase changes partially. So they were done with certain frequency, the same class of discriminatory actions. For the discriminatory impact, we have to prove something quite different. Saying that F produces a discriminatory effect, it can be an action or a norm, involves saying that F has an effect and the effect is an unequal distribution of certain services or groups between one group of which the discriminated person is part of and a control group that doesn't have the protected attribute. And besides, it involves saying that by virtue of this distribution, the first group, G1, has access to those goods or services at certain level. And group two has a different access. We will talk about a case of discriminatory impact if level one is lower than level two and if it's disproportionate, therefore a value judgment is involved. Intersectional discrimination involves different phrases. Factor F is intersectionally uh, discriminatory if those who possess the protected attribute and a level of access to certain good of service, if F confers to those who possess a protected attribute, a level of access to the same good of service, and if F confers to both another level of access to goods or services, it will be intersectionally uh, discriminatory when the third level of access is lower to the level conferred for those who possess the attribute one and attribute two. Finally, the idea of instrumental justification that I, I explained in the beginning, it involves uh, several descriptive phrases saying that a factor is instrumentally justified, gives rise to an instrumental justification, saying that that factor gives rise to a certain state of things, a distributive state of things, and that factor has the purpose of achieving a different state of things, and gives rise to that is empirically relevant to achieve the second state of things. That case will be justified, and according to the degree of empirical relevance of one state of things with respect to the other, it could be more or less justified. And these changes, if we talk about statistical justification, if there's a statistical discrimination, this is when the possession of an attribute is not statistically justified. Saying, that it is instrumentally justified, that is possessing an attribute is statistically relevant with respect to the possession of other. To finish, I would say that we can see that for the proof of discrimination, there are different descriptive phrases and also highlight that some phrases refer to individual acts like discriminatory actions 
what was the purpose of the individual with certain movement or certain distribution. And many others refer to statistical phrases or frequency statistics. If we are before uh, discriminatory practice or not, if there's an impact or not, if there's intersectional discrimination or not, or if there's a statistical relevance that justifies instrumentally a distinction or not. Each one of these involves several problems for the theory of the proof and for the regulation. And with this, I finish my participation and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alejo, for your brilliant presentation to have a general concept of discrimination. It gives us common elements, but also it allows us to see the different elements that characterizes the different forms of discrimination, the descriptive phrases. And also we can see that the object of proving makes us think about the legally relevant proofs in a trial where, where we have to prove uh, discrimination in its different forms. Next, I'm going to give the floor to Silvia. Silvia, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I also thank the Constitutional Studies Center for this new invitation to talk about this. My topic today is uh, probative debates, the most usual probative debates in two types of specific cases of discrimination. I'm going to talk about indirect discrimination and covered discrimination. Before starting, I'm going to start with a compared study of cases resolved in the international law of human rights, fundamentally in regional systems and also in the universal system by several committees of treaties. So first, I part with the foundation of the convenience of a conceptual difference between cases of indirect discrimination and covered discrimination. Why? Because in the academia, in literature, you see that some people identify covered discrimination as a case of indirect discrimination, but we would have to discover the actual truth and also say covered uh, discrimination is a subtype of indirect discrimination. And my proposal is in the sense of the, the former. It's a subtype of direct discrimination where you conceal the actual intention. And the proof, I was invited to explain this, helps us to see the convenience of making this conceptual distinction from a more pragmatic perspective. So the distinction between direct and indirect discrimination, what prevails is the intention in direct discrimination and the effects in indirect discrimination. So an initial attempt before mentioning some cases, we have to distinguish conceptually between indirect and covered discrimination, according to what Alejo also said. And in compared domestic jurisdiction and international law of human rights, there's, there are some changes in languages, but the concept is uh, presented similarly. Direct discrimination is when a apparently neutral measure has a disproportionate adverse effect in protected uh, groups. And this impact has no justification, even though personally I have reservations about uh, this in cases of indirect discrimination, but I leave that to other occasion. In, in cases of indirect discrimination, the emphasis is on the effects of a measure. And the problem is the non-consideration of differences when we make a relation that shouldn't have been neutral or an underlying con uh, condition so a good regulation with good intentions doesn't have neutral effects, but adverse effects for a specific group. Whereas the covert discrimination happens when there's an intention related to uh, 
a category protected by anti-discriminatory rules, but this intention is concealed behind the veil of legality and in, in the discretional powers of authorities, also non-state actors. So in the, in the cases of uh, covert discrimination, different to uh, indirect discrimination, the emphasis is the presence of uh, a concealed intention. And the problem can be different. This is a problem closer to direct discrimination, that is the use of protected categories and the continuity of the validity of prejudices, but in a concealed or camouflaged manner. So there, there are several reasons that justify this distinction when it is make the underlying causes visible to each type of uh, discrimination that can be different. In terms of uh, legal reasoning, this distinction also allows to use or evaluate the legal reasoning, but also it allows to emphasize in probative terms what is being uh, attempted to prove or justify and also make this making this distinction is very useful for the remedies or restitutions saying well the underlying problem problem is different so i recognize that in some types of cases this line can be blurry but even though it is blurry there the distinction is justified i'm going to exemplify this with several cases as i was saying to exemplify this, this distinction and focus on the pervasive problems of these cases. I'm going to talk about several cases in the international law of human rights, a compared study of all the cases on covert discrimination and the cases of indirect discrimination known fundamentally by the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the Human Rights Commissions of the UN the Committee for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Committee for All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and the Committee on the Rights of Disabled People. These are the committees that have the majority of indirect uh, discrimination cases. So with this, we made this compared evaluation with, and it's not very complex. So first I'm going to talk about the cases of indirect discrimination, focusing specifically on the pervasive uh, debates. And then I'll talk about the cases of indirect discrimination, focusing on the pervasive debates. And of course, I can't mention all the cases in the international law of human rights, but I chose, I've chosen those who better represent this. The first case is the case Granin and others against versus Venezuela. This case was judged by the Inter-American Commission, then by the Inter-American Court. This case is about uh, a media outlet. The media outlet Radio Caracas Televisión had one concession for the use of the radio electrical spectrum. And it's uh, this uh, media opposes uh, the government, Hugo Chavez, and their concession for this spectrum would terminate it, and the executive branch would have to make the discretionary decision of renewing or not this spectrum to continue operating. Well, the case has some debates about legal people in the inter-American system, and it was judged that people who define the editorial line, natural people were behind the media outlet, and therefore they exercise their freedom of speech through the media outlet. And therefore it is acceptable to present this case, although the, the action of the state was against a legal person. But what's relevant for discrimination, is this is the first time that the court expresses more explicitly the problem of those who allocate uh, a case of covert discrimination, unlike direct discrimination cases where there's a great differentiation, the category is clear, 
in the norm, in the practice, and in the legal decision. And the emphasis is what's the justification, whereas it is acceptable according to the methodology used. In the cases of covert discrimination, there's a first probative problem, that is, that intention is concealed, and also the use of the protected category is concealed. So what happened? Well, they say that the reason of not renewing is our political opinion. This is protected by the convention expressed by our editorial line. And the government said, well, the political opinion has nothing to do. We are pluralists. And the reason of this, these are technical reasons. And I needed that spectrum to create a new channel. And these are the reasons why it, it was necessary to create that new channel. So the state in its arg argumentation, the categories not present in the administrative act, but also the justification in the litigation about the discrimination at the international level is a justification that is still covering the category that the petitioners are arguing. That was the actual reason. What happened in this case? I want to know if the declared and declared by the state has probative elements. So since this is uh, an alleged differenti differentiation, first, we shouldn't expect a direct proof. And here we have the importance of the role of the elements of context to run this veil of illegality and say the reason, the real reason is not what you are saying, state, but the actual reason is a protected category or a retaliation related to a protected category. So in, the, in this case, we took into account, starting from the basis of not having a direct proof, several elements of context were taken into account, not only the editorial line that opposed the government from Radio Caracas, Radio y Televisión, but also ambivalent ones. And President Chavez's discourse always questioned Radio Caracas and constantly re recalling the expiration date of the concession. And also there was another media outlet whose concession would expire at the same date and that media outlet, outlet modified their editorial line based on this uh, censorship environment and this media outlet received a renewal of their concession. So with these elements, more contextual elements, the court concluded that the actual reason it was it was a retaliation for the expression of political opinions. And then we have the case San Miguel Sosa and others versus Venezuela. This is a case that I like to explain cover, uh, to explain cover discrimination because it it has to do with not having a direct proof and the importance of context um, elements in this type of cases. So the San Miguel Sosa case is three public officials of the executive branch, a technical entity. They were not political appointments. Those officials worked in a technical institution called National Council of Borders. And they had the work there for several administrations, different administrations, that is, the, those were technical positions. In 2004, there was a revocation a referendum of the presidential mandate in Venezuela. There was the possibility via referendum to revoke the presidential mandate and a revocation referendum was called in 2004 and these three officials who presented the case before the Inter-American system signed the call to this uh, revocation referendum. So what happened is given the number of signatures collected, President Chavez asked the National Electoral Council that was not very independent to give him the list of the people who had signed the call to this referendum. 
and they gave him that list and then it, it, it was published in the official website of a lawmaker of the of in favor of the government so once this is published and known these three officials well they were notified that they were going to be dismissed so what happens of course, they argued this was a case of discrimination because they expressed their political opinions by signing the revocation referendum, whereas the state, more explicitly than in the case of Radio Caracas Television, denied any retaliation due to their political opinions. And what they said is, well, it was not because of that. The reason is, first, I have the discretional power because Clause number seven of the contract allows me, it, they have no stability, so I can't renew or I can uh, terminate the work relationship. That was true. It was, this was set forth by the contract. In, on the other hand, the state said, well, this institution was in a restructuring process, and in that process, I had to make some staff adjustments. So in his uh, uh, discretional power, I'm going to dismiss these three people. So once again, we have one version of the facts and the state that says it has nothing to do with that. It hasn't to do with the category, but other objective motives independent from that category. So in this case, again, the court speaks clearly of the importance of the context and proof in this kind of cases and also criticizes the approach of the Venezuelan legislative branch when it solved the cases at the national level because they, they went to the inter-American system and they say that the approach of these judges that uh, heard of the cases nationally, they demanded uh, direct proof and they said that they didn't prove the use of the category. It was uh, an inadequate category for processes of covert discrimination. So which, what were the, what were the elements taken into account by the Inter-American Court saying that the, the end declared by the study is not the actual end? Well, they took into account that these officials had been worked despite the existence of this discretionary clause, their contracts had been renewed repeatedly and that's, a sign that was proved that there was satisfaction with their work and their contract had been renewed. They've been working in the institution for many years. The other element is that a group of officials between 20 and 25 officials in the entity, the other, the only people who were dismissed were, were those who signed the call to this referendum. So there was a coincidence in one process of restructuring you uh, dismiss the people who signed the call. And the other element is that they, they, there were four people, three were the victims of the case, and the fourth person was reinstated who, because he removed his signature. So people may uh, retract from their signature. So from the four people dismissed, the only one that was restituted was the person who, uh, retracted the inclusion of his signature. On the other hand, we have a more general context and, and part of this course of the president was without naming them, identified the officials that signed this uh, referendum as traitors. And he, he was threatening to retaliate for this reason, although he, he didn't say specifically which type of retaliation. So with these elements, we had, well, the Inter-American Court concluded that the state didn't undo the presumption with the prima facie case presented by the petitioners based on these initial elements. Well, these are the cases of covert discrimination. There's a pending case, very similar, the one that Alejo mentioned is a case against Costa Rica about disability and non-contracting of one person due to disability reasons. 
in that case, the person obtained the best uh, mark and he was not contracted. There were several uh, proofs and they showed that the uh, actual reason was his disability. Now, while this case is still pending with a hearing and with a, a judgment. So this is what I wanted to share about covert discrimination and the importance of the elements of context and the proof concepts. Something that is debated in this point and going back to the basic structure of a case of discrimination that Alejo mentioned, particularly the element of justification, the Inter-American Court had a different approach in the case San Miguel Sosa. They say, when I run the veil of legality, when I identify that the actual reason is not the reason uh, said by the state, it doesn't make sense to take a step of justification. It doesn't uh, they, uh, make sense to have a test of proportionality for the justification step because the state was denying the, the end they were pursuing and that covering entails this, so it doesn't make sense. You, well, what you were saying you were pursuing, it's a lie now justified that you, what you were looking for with that uh, retaliation or covering. So somehow the bad faith and the coverage of the measure shows that the uh, trial of proportionality doesn't apply. This is what the court said in the case San Miguel Sosa, concluding discrimination by identifying the actual truth. So now I'm going to explain the indirect discrimination cases and some probative elements in the international law of human rights. I'm going to talk about other systems of uh, protection, both the European Court of Human Rights and the Committees of Treaties. Well, to talk about the probative elements in the cases of indirect discrimination, I'm going to remember the basic structure of a case. This was mentioned by Alejo in the beginning. The measure, apparently neutral measure, uh, disproportionate impact in protected groups, and one that is less explicit in the allocation of cases in the international law of human rights, and is a more explicit debate in uh, domestic jurisdiction is causality. causality. In cases of direct discrimination, that can take two shapes. The relationship of causality between the apparently neutral measure and the adver disproportionate adverse impact due to the causality between the disproportionate impact and the protected category. So thinking about the two different ways of causality that can lead to this, this can also have probative impl implications according to the defense strategy opted by the state. And once again, we have this, uh, the justification step in, in the case of indirect discrimination from my point of view. I am skeptical about using a step of justification, at least with the same methodology of proportionality imported from cases of direct discrimination. This is a methodology of uh, justification around an end. And in cases of indirect discrimination in which the intention is irrelevant, I think it's difficult to make a uh, a judgment of proportionality, but again, this is a topic for another discussion. In general, some bodies of treaties, according to international courts, they only reach the conclusion that the fact to be the measure and the disproportionate adverse impact on one group and the causality another uh, make the step of justification. But the pervasive element in the cases of indirect discrimination, mostly, revolve around the adverse disproportionate impact. Although if we use the step of justification, it can be relevant in the step of justification depending on the method used. And if it's a proportionality trial, apart from assessment elements, there are empirical elements that should be used as the least uh, harmful measures. 
So there are pervasive uh, debates regarding the impact and the possible step up justification, but most of the debates have to do with the proof of the adverse disproportionate impact. I'm going to talk about topics linked to proof in the cases of indirect discrimination and the type of proof that is usually used in these cases in international law of human rights. Another is the burden of proof. So regarding the type of proof in all these cases of indirect discrimination, we identified two approaches. One has to do with the use of statistics has been preponderant to reach the conclusion that there was a uh, disproportionate adverse impact. And the second approach are cases in which, which there's no statistical proof or no statistical information is requested and the conclusion of the disproportionate adverse impact is based on logical differences, not necessarily linked to statistical proofs. So some examples of each one of these approaches. With respect to cases in which the conclusion of the disproportionate adverse impact is based on statistics, the first example I'd like to share is the case Trujillo Calero versus Ecuador. This is in 2018. And this is a case that analyzes a scheme of social security that prevented the victim of the case. It was a woman from obtaining her retirement of a social security scheme that didn't take into account the time during which she uh, performed unpaid domestic work and after inaccurate information in her request or application of retirement, she was told she didn't have the requirements to prove the, the time required for her retirement. So the committee said there was a, a disproportionate adverse impact and also it established that this social security scheme had a disproportionate adverse impact on women based on the public information available, according to which within people in uh, labor age out of the labor market, those who solely work uh, at home and not pay their women. So we have this case where the disproportionate adverse impact is evaluated from uh, public information from the state. Then we have the, the case in Ajeno versus Italy from 2020. This is a case of the Human Rights Committee in which the application of one victim was rejected to access to uh, the firefighters department due to her height. So they said that in order to be part of it, you needed to be 1.65 centimeters tall. And the Human Rights Committee said is that this requirement produced a disproportionate impact for women, excluding a large number of women to be part of the firefighters department because the mean according the average height of women in Italy was 1.61 centimeters. And then we have the case of DH and others against Czech Republic in 2007. It, this is one of the paradigmatic cases and there were many others after this of the European system of human rights about indirect discrimination. This case was uh, the fact of segregation of boys and girls who were Romani as a consequence of an educational policy that established several objective exams, including psychological tests to identify that boys and girls had special needs in terms of education. But what happened in practice is that this type of test cost that boys and girls who had special needs were mostly uh, Romani, and this produced uh, de facto segregation due to ethnical reasons. The disproportionate impact, in this case, the European court is strongly based on statistics. And what they evaluate is being a minority population, the Romani population in Czech Republic, the prevalence in schools with special needs, they have a different curriculum is a disproportionate prevalence compared 
to the number of people in the country of this ethnic origin. And the European Court of Human Rights said, said that the figures revealed a predominant trend that was also confirmed by the other independent bodies for the supervision of human rights. It says that it was necessary to establish the exact number of uh, Romanians, boys and girls in these classes. What they had to demonstrate statistically was the disproportion. And also, in terms of the burden of proof, they said that these statistics were, were not given uh, by the state to challenge this. And the, the second approach in terms of type of proof The not, use, not using statistics, but rather with inferences linked to the nature of the facts involved. So one example of this is the case SC, ICP versus Italy. It's from uh, 2019 of the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee that has to do with uh, assisted reproduction techniques, especially in vitro fertilization, the prohibition, the regulation in Italy of revoking consent after uh, applying the treatment for the implantation of the embryos. That norm prevented both men and women, that is uh, uh, those who gave the, the egg and the sperm, they could revoke the consent when the implantation had been done and well, the disproportionate adverse impact on women is clearly inferable because the norm puts women at risk due to uh, forced medical operations. So this has a much worse impact on women without statistical information, without showing how many women haven't been able to revoke their consentment, but only based on an inf inference on the facts. And because pregnancy only occurs on, on women or people who are able to, uh, to procreate. And there's another case from 2018, the case Domina versus Denmark. This is a case in which it was established that it was necessary to, for the family reunification a Danish person that wants to reunite with a partner or with a family member that was not a national citizen, they should demonstrate that that person should be able to uh, self-sustain uh, himself. It's gonna be a burden for the country in the conclusion of the Committee of Disabled People is for, for the case of these people due to his disability, the partner of this Danish citizen this demand of self-sufficiency was a demand that had a more adverse effect to her and therefore she couldn't reunite with him due to her disability because she couldn't demonstrate that self-sufficiency or self-sustenance in the country and they didn't ask for how many people with disability have not been able to reunite only with the circumstances of the cases they concluded that for her there was a differentiated impact based on a category, even though the category was not explicit in the norm. And I know uh, my time's up. If you allow me two minutes to conclude the burden of proof. Yes? Yes, go ahead. I'm going to conclude uh, the burden of proof in cases of indirect discrimination saying from the cases solved in the international law of human rights, this is the most ambivalent and confusing topic. It's ambivalent mainly on what the state has to do, what the state should contribute. There are three approaches that we can identify in these cases. Number one, the most generic one that doesn't say anything and doesn't guide the actors that litigate this kind of cases is that the state should demonstrate that it's that the measure is not discriminatory, has no discriminatory effect. This is quite ambivalent and generic and will not allow to identify if 
if it's in the step of demonstrating the impact or the justification, this is very generic. There are the decision with a different uh, language and what the state has to demonstrate when the petitioner proved the disproportionate adverse impact with statistics or with inferences, whatever the approach is, what the state has to do is to demonstrate that they have no objective and reasonable justification with the proportionality trial that has been the approach. It, and what the bodies and uh, courts have, have said is that there's no causality. They show that the differentiated impact has nothing to do with the protected category, but with other factor, or there's no relationship between the apparent neutral measure and the adverse situation of the protected group. So trying to organize this, one could propose or distinguish between burden of proof and the possible competences of a state, especially in these litigations of international law of human rights as a starting point and following the basic structure of a discrimination, discrimination case. When you think about the common elements, the starting point would be if the petitioner has to demonstrate the apparent neutral measure and the disproportionate adverse impact at least create a strong doubt that there's a disproportionate adverse impact and the state has to justify and if that justification is objective and reasonable. But when you see this from the possible defenses of a state, it's not necessarily a probative burden in this type of cases, the state can say, well, I'm going to focus on demonstrating that that uh, adverse disproportionate impact didn't exist. So they gave uh, alternative statistics and different information that showed that this didn't happen, that this proportion didn't happen. Another possibility is to say that there are no causality relationships. So depending on the defense opted for by the state, In the cases of indirect discrimination, the defense of the state can also focus on the first case, which is the impact, and they should have to provide the alternative proof. And just to conclude, what I want to leave on the table, and it's a complication, especially in international law of human rights, is that sometimes the production of statistics is an international obligation. That is, what are the implications for the private burden in, in the case of indirect discrimination when the petitioner has no way to produce those statistics or they do not exist or they ask for information and the statistics were not given, especially when the state should have produced them because this is an international obligation, like the Convention on the Persons with Disabilities establishes for state parties, the obligation to produce statistics. When it is the obligation of the state, how this can uh, decrease the burden of the petitioners and reverse the burden. This is something I'm going to, to, to leave there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your brilliant presentation, we can see in practice the different pervasive problems that court, international courts face in indirect and direct discrimination and reflect on the burden of proof. What you said, how a conception of burden of proof as a rule to contribute the proof when you have the obligation to produce statistics now, we will start with our last speaker, Justice Ana Maria Ibarra. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Josue. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Alejo and Silvia, for your presentations. It is an honor for me and a great opportunity to talk about this topic that hasn't been developed very much in the academic realm. So it is a pleasure to be with you today. I'm going to focus 
on one of the problems or techniques to solve these complexities mentioned by Alejo and Silvia related to the use of presumptions. I'm going to share my screen. There it is. Well, throughout my presentation, I'm going to say that presumptions help to solve these conflicts of uncertainty, but not only due to practical or probabilistic reasons, but behind they have moral justification. In this sense, what I'm going to say is that the presumptions use of the right against discrimination are more similar to that type of presumptions of criminal law, like the presumption of innocence. To argue this thesis, what I did in a study I conducted was to analyze the paradigmatic cases of the European Court of Human Rights the Court of Justice of the European Union and the Supreme Court of the UK and the Supreme Court of the US and the Supreme Court of Canada. Why these courts and not others? Well, from my point of view, certainly I missed many, but these courts have a more consolidated practice, especially when we talk about indirect discrimination, but evidently, there are many other courts that are also applying uh, innovative approaches about this. So what I'm going to assert today is a very descriptive vision. It's not normative or critical, but what I could see in this uh, legal practice. Very briefly, to this end, I will talk about uh, direct and indirect discrimination. But I think that I subscribe to what Alejo Giles said. I will not delve into this, but I'm going to uh, try to show a scheme of adjudication of the right against discrimination to see where their presumptions are in indirect and direct discrimination, their use and their function, and also what their justification could be. Well, as Alejo said as well, I think, well, not I think, but what I could see in the conventions on human rights and constitutions and jurisprudences of these countries is that discrimination is this, is the denial to the access of goods or um, services that are legally relevant, but this distinction should be based on a protected category and also unjustified. So these are qualifiers of discrimination. And now the distinction can be manifested expressly in their norm practice or criterion or implicitly, and it can be seen only in the results. Here we have the cover of one of the speakers who talked about indirect discrimination Professor Ekata, that he talked about this fable of the fox and the heron. This is the case, the first case of indirect discrimination. This is an apparently neutral practice. Well, the fox is showing this plate to the heron. But this becomes a practice that denies the possibility of having dinner to the heron. So this, this is how we can uh, portray indirect discrimination. Very quickly, this is how we could see this argumentative scheme. Of course, making abstractions after the analysis of all these cases. First, we see there's a distinction and that distinction or denial of rights can be expressed. In this case, we talk about direct discrimination or, or else it can be manifested in the results and then we talk about direct discrimination. There's a second moment. 
a provative or argumentative moment that has to do with a justification. The courts have admitted the possibility of these distinctions even based on specially protected categories are justified. But then this is something that has to be proved. And now we are going to see who has to prove this burden of justification. What I think we can see in the majority of these cases, it's important to say that in this doctrine that I reviewed, the United States is foreign to this. So the affirmations or generalizations I'm going to make today are far from the practice of the Supreme Court of the US. Despite being the pioneer in indirect discrimination, it, it has been uh, getting away from the general practice. What we see in most of the cases is that there's a prima facie case of discrimination when it is demonstrated somehow that there's discrimination based on this specially protected category that can also be manifested in the results. That produces the presumption of a case of discrimination. So this in consequence produces to reverse the burden of the proof to the demanded entity it can be an individual or the state. That's why it's we have this dotted line trying to present a presumption and that practice is unjustified. So the the accused should show that that is justified. So there's a reverse of the burden of proof by virtue of a presumption derived of this prima facie case. When we talk about direct discrimination, the maneuver is relatively simple to establish a prima facie case because the distinction is going to be seen expressly in the practice or norm. So the defendant shall only be referred to that practice norm or criterion that is denying the access to these rights or goods that are legally relevant. And therefore the discussion, and in fact, what courts have been doing is to determine when a distinction is justified. And to this end, they have used the test of equality. It is based on the doctrine of the Supreme Court of the United States with different stages. But also an interesting part has to do with the levels of scrutiny because apart from reversing the burden of proof to the defendant, it has to justify, well, the defendant has to justify his practices and with a persuasion burden, it's not the same as probative standard. He has to give very powerful reasons to justify this practice. So we see that that is not only a presumption and this presumption generates the reverse of the burden of proof. But also this reversal of the burden of proof is very onerous and very high for the defendant. He has to give very strong reasons. So we would have to think what's behind or what he would be justify or what would be justifying these pervasive burdens and argumentative burdens. Some people say that the narrow test is narrow in theory, precisely because it's very onerous. Now, this complicates when we talk about indirect discrimination because when we establish a prima facie case, I exemplify it with moment one, is much more complex than when we talk about direct discrimination because it is there or it is evident or palpable. Moment one to establish a prima facie case of indirect discrimination, what we see is that the courts, in fact, are not dialoguing like with intentionality, but they're focused on the results. Or what their concern is to a great extent is the famous disproportionate uh, results or impacts. And this disproportionate impact itself 
produces different uh, probative difficulties. As Silvia said, in most of the cases, how you prove a disproportion through statistics, statistical evidence. And this evidence implies many problems or complexities. First, the judges should be able to read these statistics uh, that the uh, parties may contribute this statistic. They should be available, as Sylvia said. Another matter around the disproportionate impact has to do to what disproportionate is. This is an elemental question, but the courts have said like uh, large differences. If we, we can't uh, talk about disproportion, if it's 60, 40% of 51, 49, there should be a large difference in the access to goods or rights between these specially protected groups. But another problem that seem to be interesting has to do with causality. The defendant has to show that there's a criterion, criterion that for a material cost is generating this disproportionate impact. But what is not unknown and what the courts do not discuss that much, maybe there are two judgments that discuss that, if actually that norm practice or criterion produced that result. That is, if there's an actual causality. Why? Because when we talk about these results, these disproportionate results, it can happen that they are results from a historical or structural discrimination. Maybe there are different classes operating together, different characteristics that this specially protected group have prevented them from obtaining this benefit, like the case Sylvia mentioned about uh, children with disabilities, they are given this test, but it turned out that Romanese children were sent to special education schools because they have a lower performance. So what produced this result? What's causing Romanese children to have less uh, academic skills? Is it the test? but also conditions, they can be social, family, language, food conditions that may generate this result. And here, everything is complex and interesting because who is responsible for this when we do not know if that norm practice or criterion actually caused that disproportionate impact. But what happens or what we see in the case log is that they don't want, the courts do not want to discuss these problems of causality. There's a very interesting judgment of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom where they said causality is not the same as co-relationship. What I'm interested as court is to show a co-relationship between the practice norm and criteria and the disproportionate impact, but causality is very complex to prove even in natural sciences, you can run multiple regressions, etc. but what is shown is that one event is associated with other, not that one event causes another one and law is not foreign to these problems. But how do they solve this in the courts? Well, through a presumption that it's enough to establish two known elements like the norm and the disproportionate impact to reach to an unknown event that the norm is generating this disproportionate effect. So there's a first presumption, but just as with uh, indirect discrimination, it operates in a second moment, the presumption of in justification of that disproportionate impact. In the second moment, argumentative moment, there are two presumptions operating uh, consecutively or at the same time. So something I was, Sylvia mentioned that is quite relevant is how we demonstrate this presumption of injustification. justification. 
do we use the test of equality as with direct discrimination or shall we talk about another way to undermine these presumptions? Here, there are two strategies of the defendant. The defendant can either block their presumptions or refute their presumptions. How do we block a presumption? By saying that some of the elements of the presumptions are false, they do not exist, like the disproportionate impact is not real, that the, dispro that the statistics were not well collected, that they are comparing groups uh, unduly, and saying it, he, it was not his test or something else that generated that disproportionate result. And also, of course, in the second moment, is to say, yes, there's a prima facie case of direct discrimination, but what I'm going to show to the court is that it, that practice was necessary. The test of the, well, the firefighters, the Supreme Court of the US, it's necessary to have certain aerobic capacity to perform well their duties. So the burden of the proof is on the defendant. Nevertheless, the disproportionate result, it is a necessary measure. The pervasive problems, well, there are many. I was mentioning some of them and also Silvia and Alejo. Well, the problem, as we said, of statistical evidence, the difficulty of the access to it, it's not the only proof to uh, demonstrate the disproportionate impact. Sometimes you don't need a complex mathematical operation to demonstrate when the disproportions are large. The differentiated impact implies also problems on choosing the size of the samples, for example, and what we are going to compare. The group of women or pregnant women only, the periods to run these statistics, all these are problems that are present when we discuss these topics. And the burden of proof, it's very interesting because as Silvia said, there's no real definition, but rather the practice that has established these presumptions and therefore they have reversed the burden of proof to the defendant. But this is not something that is uh, written in, in stone. This has been reorganized in the practice of the courts. And the standard to establish these presumptions and refute these presumptions is not clear. Most of the courts of human rights use the preponderance, the standard of preponderance of evidence. But this is uh, done very implicitly in all these matters. And also causality, I mentioned already some uh, complexities, but I'd like to mention that also causality of the statistical proofs show frequencies of events. They show individual causalities. So there are also problems with what statistics show is that this happens between groups. But when we talk about discrimination, we talk about people individually. So how do we connect these two pervasive levels, the generic level with the individual one? This is something that is also involved. And finally, the presumptions, as we saw, how, we, how they operate when we establish a prima facie case. And just to wrap up, I'd like to say that, well, presumptions are everywhere. We need them to live. We can't prove each one of the things, but also in law. Uh, law is plagued with presumptions. It is presumed that he is a biological son, the missing person is presumed to be dead after a certain time, etc. So what's the justification behind these presumptions? Well, there's an unknown act from a known act. 
there can be several ones. There can be an empirical reason, epistemic, a practical reason, because it is easier or a moral one. In the case of direct discrimination and indirect discrimination, I think we have the three. The, the three of them are in play. They are latent, but I do think it is the, the moral reason justifies ultimately to use these presumptions. I'm going to explain this. I think it is valid to presume from the epistemic standpoint that if a group is being denied a right or a legally relevant good, this is part of a historical pattern because that's the origin of the specially protected categories, the history of abuses, of denial of rights. So if nowadays we see a person in this situation, I think it's valid to assume prima facie that it's part of its pattern, factual pattern. The practical reasons are also latent in the right against discrimination, saying that the statistical proofs are very complex. Why shall we demand someone to produce this and the practice is unjustified? If we require the intention, he didn't have the intention to discriminate. And also normally the discriminating entity or presumably discriminating has a position of more advantage and pervasive accessibility from, but from my point of view, this practical reason is not enough because it could be solved with other pervasive maneuvers, like the famous dynamic burden of the proof. There are different strategies that could relieve these practical difficulties, or as the courts have done nowadays, they, um, uh, motu proprio obtain the statistical information and the defendant is not showing this statistical proof to establish the prima facie case of discrimination. But ultimately, why putting this burden on the defendant? Why do we assume that this differentiated impact bothers us, that this denial of rights bothers us if it's based on a specially protected category. Well, I think that the ultimate reason is a moral reason. The courts actually consider unfair and inadmissible if there are these two relationships, denial of rights based on these specially protected categories. It is a sufficient reason to assume that this is discriminatory, that this has to be changed irrespective of that practice norm or criterion produced that disproportionate result, what bothers the courts is that inequality of rights and results. And this has to be changed. Similarly, this is what is behind this uh, reasoning. And therefore, I think that there's a commitment with substantive equality, with a material equality or factual equality. And this is what courts are assuming all the time when they establish these presumptions and these reversals of the burden of proof. Another discussion, finally, has to do with who establishes these rules. Presumptions are rules that at the end of the day will produce serious consequences, like determining if the entity discriminated or not. Normally, this has been established by the judges, and there's a lot of discussion with the proof uh, theory, theory experts if establishing these uh, presumptions, reversals for, of burden of proof, etc. In my opinion, I do think so. I think that the judges also produce law and tests, and there's always a pioneer case that will be used to standardize but our concern is the legal certainty. What could be expected is that these practices afterwards and these rules to be fixed to allow to produce this uh, legal certainty for the parties. And with that, I would finish. Thank you very much for, your, for the time. Thank you very much, Justice Ana Maria Ibarra. We've received many questions during today's table due to time constraints.
we can't pose them all. I'll try to group the questions. Well, the rational conception of the proof shows that the institutional objective of the proof is to look for the truth in the jurisdictional processes, underlining a truth as a correspondence with what happened in reality, assuming under this conception that the burden of proof is a rule of distribution, that is to give the proof when it is available. One of the groups of question is, depending on the types of discrimination that we've seen, direct and indirect, if it's uh, attributed to the state or individuals, who has the burden of proof as a rule of contribution? The defendant, the plaintiff, the state? Can the jurisdictional body make a probative activity to give proof to prove the existence of discrimination? Or should the parties generate an exercise of contradiction of these means? Now, in the evaluation of the means, what are the reliability criteria of the statistics? As Ms. Silvia said, regularly, that's the most uh, present means in direct discrimination. So how does a judge assess the reliability of the statistics? Taking into account, it may come from different sources. And finally, the standard. Does the probative standard vary according to the party that is being demanded? As Justice Ana Maria said, could we say that due to a moral decision, the standard can only be, well, if the statistic says it's 51% of a discriminatory structure against the plaintiff, or should we look for a higher standard? This could be the first group of questions. We received another one. The fact of not being in a protected category entails that you cannot be subject to discrimination. A person who is not part of a protected category could argue that he has been subject to discrimination, indirect discrimination. Now, shall we answer? However you want. I, I don't know who would like to take the floor first, maybe Alejo. Okay, we can follow the same order as before. It's a bombarding of questions. I'll start with the latter. I think this is a conceptual matter. If we define discrimination as what happens to those who have a protected attribute, I would say, if you don't have that attribute, you conceptually can't be discriminated. But this concept does not imply that it is, the distinction is not questionable because it can be an arbitrary distinction that is questionable in many legal systems is unreasonable, at least in Argentina. The this arbitrary distinctions can be declared unconstitutional because they are unreasonable. If I want to control who those who drive are good drivers, well, you would demand them to, to have certain requirements. So what you are seeing is unreasonable because those who don't, uh, don't are not lawyers are in a protected category because the conceptual debate does not say if it's questionable or not, a distinction on the basis of another legal rules that banned in this case, the unreasonable distinctions. In general, 
who has the burden of proof? And if the standard for is, I would say that's the focus of the debate and it's under debate. So perhaps we can say it is convenient that it varies. In which aspects should it vary? With respect to which uh, phrases? So the question whether it varies or not will depend largely on how it is regulated in each context. As, as Ana Maria said, this is not usually regulated. So how are the courts judging in each context? With respect to the standard, for example, it would be interesting to think, for example, a type of case. I think that each type of case of discrimination could enable different conclusions about how we can handle the burden of proof and the standards. But I'm going to base on one in which direct discrimination is covered, as Silvia said. How can we know if they didn't hire me because I am a disabled person or due to other reasons? In our courts, what they say is that you show a prima facie case, that is, show me that it was due to the distinction because of your disability. What's the meaning of that? Well, we can translate this into a standard different a different standard to put the burden of proof on the uh, defend, defendant. So they are asking me to rule out the most usual hypothesis for which I wouldn't be hired. I'm not hired because I am disabled. I can get in others' minds, but if I show that I was the best uh, qualified so I rule out the reason of lack of training or, or uh, similar training levels as others. I show that I went to the interview at the right time, that I fulfilled the other requirements. So I'm going to rule out the most usual reasons for which the employer may not hire me beyond my condition. This idea, of course, I'm not ruling out all the reasons that could explain the decision, but by ruling the most usual ones, it suffices to have my uh, initial burden. And then we would have the burden of the counterparty to discredit this uh, state. That's uh, the possibility to apply the idea of standards to types of phrases that have to be proved in the cases of discrimination, but there are many possibilities. And now with respect to the reliability criteria of statistics, Resort where we, we, we resort to the statistical discipline. Well, you get you have to in order to assess the reliability of certain information, you have to turn to the criteria used by epistemology to assess it. That could be, for example, if the population equals the sample. In this case, the, we, this could be descriptive statistics. If the sample is smaller than the population, these uh, are inferential statistics. And there are other problems about the conditions with us, how we, with a small sample, we can reach conclusions of a larger population. So 
we should refer to those debates in the scope of uh, statistics. I'm going to give the floor now to my colleagues. Shall I go first, Ana Maria? Yes, go ahead, Silvia. Perfect. I'm going to answer some of the questions. I think Alejandro Alejo, sorry, already answered. I know if your name is Alejandro or Alejo. Alejo is, is what your name says. Alejo already answered some of them. Some additional comments about some of the questions, starting with the last one. I agree with what Alejo said. If there's a protect category, can we talk about discrimination or not? Well, the idea is to differentiate between formal equality and differences in, in treatment, arbitrary or un unjustified treatment that are not linked necessarily to categories. And this is a case of equality. It is a case of equality, not necessarily discrimination linked to especially protected categories due to different reasons, including historical reasons of uh, structural disadvantages, but it's, it doesn't mean it's not possible that formulating a case of discrimination when there's an arbitrary treatment, even though no, even though there's no presence of category in the inter-American system, there are cases of uh, differences of treatment for reasons not linked to categories and a case related to what was judged by the Supreme Court of Mexico is the case of the uh, preventive arrest or the excarceration. That differentiation based on the type of crime for not to enjoy the right to be judged in, in freedom. It's, there's a presumption of innocence of, because one person is being processed for a crime, whether it is justified or not. These cases have been heard of in the inter-American system from the point of view of equality. In Venezuela, judges that were uh, dismissed arbitrarily, they were not reinstated. The inter-American uh, court said that was unjustified, they will uh, exercise the same legal role and they can have the right to their reinstatement. So they are differentiating uh, categories. They can be arbitrary, it can be also a case of equality, but this is a matter of intensity and suspicion. In the case of uh, specially protected categories, there's a different approach in terms of the suspicion of discrimination and the vulneration of the rights. And this also activates different levels of scrutiny. Anyway, I'd like to mention as well that many times the case is formulated with respect to uh, a category non, not explicitly protected but with anti-discrimination rules to expand that catalog of protected categories. So in the first case that I was mentioning, they can be processed for a specific crime. It's, those would be equality cases, but it can happen that someone files a case where they allege uh, discrimination is not a, uh, a explicitly protected category, but it can be uh, uh, heard by uh, international national courts to incorporate categories that have the same suspicion and the same burden than the especially protected categories that are not necessarily explicit and they, they are incorporated due to other social conditions. So we have to distinguish if when we plan to file a case based on protected categories if you want to argue that if that category is not protected specifically but should be because it's analog to some like disability, age, sexual orientation, gender identity. They are not in the non-discrimination classes or if it's rather a case of arbitrary unequal treatment that can be easily argued that is uh, equal to to the latter. 
Now, with respect to the question about the rule of contribution, I think equality and discrimination are complex issues, and this is a puzzle. As Alejo said, he has some parameters to define typologies. Other people have other parameters to define typologies in order to give sense to a principle that is complex by itself and in practice has many manifestations of discrimination. It goes from explicit to subtle and the impacts. And that's why it's worthwhile to distinguish these categories conceptually. And that's why we shouldn't standardize the cases of discrimination and not even in the specific categories of discrimination. As I said before, if there's a case of indirect discrimination, in some cases, it's very difficult to prove the impact without statistics. And in some cases, we can make a logical inference. That doesn't mean that there are inconsistencies, but the cases are not the same and we need different approaches. There's also the case of the Supreme Court of Canada that talks about this. It's a Fraser case of 2020 linked with a labor scheme and a return scheme that affected uh, police women. And they talk about when it's necessary or not to show statistical information. Having said this, I think the question is, what's a prima facie case in each type of discrimination? In the case of direct discrimination, the prima facie case and the contribution of that prima facie case is to formulate the difference in treatment and the presence of a category that will be explicit. I'm sorry, we are going to stop the broadcast. Yes, we should also identify if it's a prima facie case and assess the contribution. I'm not going to answer so that Maria may continue. Yes, I am going to say goodbye. Thank you for today's discussion. As we said, we will keep on discussing about this because th these are many aspects related to the burden. So, and to the proof, hopefully next year we organize a seminar on this to discuss thing by thing. Josue. Thank you everyone for your participation today and for this brilliant table. We would have liked to have more time and this invites us to further reflection. I invite you to keep on participating in this Congress. The next table will be on Thursday 4 from 9 to 11. And uh, we will talk about different systems of uh, anti-discriminatory in Latin America. Thank you for your participation.